Angels are in heaven, Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood Sephirim, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and one with his with two he flew. Okay, seraphim. That's the word you struggled with there, yeah. And those are angels, and they're flying, and they're there in heaven, right by the throne, right? Uh, Daniel 7. As I looked, so the throne took place, and the ancient of the days took his seat. His clothes were white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was seared with flame, it wheels of burning fire. As a stream of fire issued, it came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Okay. So there's thousands of angels, and 10,000 times 10,000 are worshiping him. All right. And uh, Bailey, what do you got? Matthew 8? I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. While the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness, in that place there will be weapons, there will be weeping, Okay, so the saints of the past, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they'll be there at the table eating, and, and we'll go and eat with them. Won't that be great? Revelation 7, verse 9, about the saints of the past being in heaven. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these? clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So that not only talks about that the saints are in heaven, but that God is caring for them and giving them a perfect life in heaven. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Um, our bodies will be in heaven. All right, let's not do all of these. That last one's pretty long. So let's take uh, Job 19, Olivia, and Payne, you can take Romans 8, Bailey, you can take 2 Timothy 4, and I'll take 1 Peter 1. Got it? Yep. Job 19. 
Our bodies will be in heaven. Go ahead. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. My eyes will see God. So in heaven, my eyes are there. My body is there. Okay. Um, Romans 8. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. In fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to the mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Okay. So your body will come to life through the Spirit of God. Okay, there's no sin or evil in heaven. 2 Timothy 4. going to give us a crown of righteousness and of course righteousness means holiness right there's no sin or evil so we will have his holiness his crown of righteousness and then i'm going to take first peter 1 3 through 5 blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ according to his great mercy he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead to inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading kept in heaven for you Okay, so our, our inheritance in heaven is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. Um, no sin or evil in heaven. Okay, and the last one, faith in Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. John 14, 5 and 6. John 3, 16. Acts 16, 19 through 6, 29 through 31. Are we ready to go? All right, John 14, 5 and 6. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yeah, the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. John three sixteen. Go ahead, you're going to say it without reading it. For gospel of the world, he is one and only son, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Okay, so whoever believes in Jesus will not perish but have eternal life in heaven, right? Okay, Acts 16. And the jailer called for light and rushed in, rush in and trembling with fear, he, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sir, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. All right, believe in the Lord and you will be saved. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. What? So Jesus, God, you know, the Holy Spirit, they're all mm -hmm. kind of like, for some people, like one person, right? They're three persons, one God. So three people, one God. Because I, I don't know, in school people would keep on saying like, yeah. there's three different gods. They're not just one or whatever. I'm like, oh. Well, no, and and it's, it's hard to understand. People get confused about it. But the way the Bible teaches it is there's one God, but that God is three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We don't try to understand it. We just do the best we can. Yeah, because people in our math class was like, oh, there's three gods. How, 
like and we like ask them how is there three gods if there's one person that created everything and you weren't doing your math you were talking about this yeah okay um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, and, and I mean, that's, that's the Trinity, and it's clearly taught in Scripture, but it's not easy to understand. In fact, I would say it's impossible to understand, but it is clearly taught that there's one God, and that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You just have to accept that based on faith. Okay, so next slide, please, Pastor Kleppy. There we go. It was. And you see what we're going to talk about now is hell. Um, there is a heaven. There is a hell. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you go to heaven. If you don't, you go to hell. So let's take a look at hell. Hell is a place of destruction for both body and soul. Matthew 10, 28. Olivia. Hell is compared to fire. Matthew 5, 21, 22. Peyton. Matthew 18, 9, Bailey. And I've got the last two. Wait, which one do you want to have? Matthew 5, 21 and 22. Okay. Okay, because you said Matthew 18, 9. That's hers. Oh. I got the name from the That's Bailey. That's okay. It's very confusing. Do you know which one you have? Yeah, sure. She knows. Got it. Okay, well, I, don't, I don't think she got dropped on her head yet. Yeah, well, I'm sure she's been dropped on her head. I know her parents. I'm quite sure as a baby she was dropped on her head several times. So that's fine. Yeah. All right. Okay, you ready? Yep. Go ahead. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Wow. It's a place of destruction. It, just, it destroys both your body and your soul. Okay. What do you got here? Matthew 5, 21, 22. You have heard that it said to So their hell is fire, right? And if your eye causes you to sin, you tear it up and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes being thrown into the hell of fire. Yeah. Okay. Does does fire sound like a good place to be? Mm-mm. No. Have you ever burned yourself? No. Yeah. I yeah. And, and doesn't it hurt like for a long time? And it hurts bad. Okay, now hell is compared to being in a fire forever. And the fire never goes out and you you don't perish. You you Does stay there hurt? in the fire. Doesn't that hurt forever? Yeah. I mean it probably maybe like wouldn't hurt because you're already dead. Well, yeah. But how I'm, would you feel pain if you're in heaven or hell? Well, you don't in heaven. There is no pain in heaven. But in hell, you're, you suffer forever. Okay, hell is eternal. Matthew 25, verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, Luke 16, 22 through 24. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water 
and cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish in this flame. Yeah, doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? He, he's begging just that somebody would dip their finger in water and put it on his tongue to cool it off a little bit. Why can't he do it himself? There's no water. He's in hell. So what do they have to drink down there? They don't. They oh. just suffer forever. All right, so... Um, hell is painful punishment. It's eternal. It's compared to fire. It's a place of destruction for both body and soul. It's a place you don't want to go. So how do you not go to hell? Jesus. You believe in what Jesus has done for you. Trust in his work and you go to heaven forever where it's streets of gold, it's a foundation of precious stones, the river of life flows through, uh, it's a, an eternal wedding feast. There's no sickness or death there's no sorrow there's no tears but at hell it's the opposite and the, at hell is the opposite yeah so um anyway that's the the end of the third article of the creed whoa what happened to me here um, i bumped my keyboard here i think it's fixed now um all right so, any questions on any of the creed? First article, God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Second article, his only son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The third article, the Holy Spirit. Which, of course, the Spirit is the one who brings us to faith, leads us into the church, and forgives our sins, which leads to our eternal life in heaven, not hell. The thing is with hell, here's how I think of it. You think of the worst possible place to be on earth. School. School? Well, I think you can probably come up with something worse than that. How about... A quiet clown. How about a Russian prison? And they think that you have information, so they're torturing you every day to get okay, information out. They, they might do that to you, yeah. Yeah, that might be the worst place in the world. Or, you know, uh, way up north, outside, with no clothes on, mm -hmm. being sprayed by a hose. It's cold in my jacket up there. Yeah. You think of the worst place on earth, and here's the deal. It's still better than hell, because the worst place on earth, God is there. In hell, God is not there. Um, a guy wrote a book about hell called The Inferno. His name was Dante. He had the longer name, but we just know him as Dante. Anyway, he put, as you enter into hell, there was a sign over the entrance, and the sign said, Abandon hope, all who enter here. There's no hope. Then just don't enter there. Yeah, well, that's the key. Go to heaven and not hell. That's the key, right? Okay, so that is the creed. It's done. So we move on to prayer. Uh, what is prayer? To talk to God. Talk to God, okay. Uh, how, how do we talk? Or <coughs> Bless you. Excuse me. Communicate with God. You can do it in your brain. And you can do it out loud, right? You can speak out loud, God will hear you. You can do it in your brain. You God can, knows your thoughts. You go to church and pray. Come to, and come to church and pray with other people. Pray as a group, which is very helpful too. Uh, maybe you pray as a family. Like at the dinner table or something. At the dinner table or, or other times. You know, Linda and I, we, uh, we don't have a family anymore. <laughs> we all moved away. But anyway, so it's just the two of us in the house. And, Adopt and, a child. Pardon? Adopt a child. <sighs> yeah. Um, so when, when we go to bed at night, we're laying in bed, not asleep yet, and we pray then. Because it's the end of the day and different concerns have come up and things that are on our mind and we pray. And we both pray out loud and... One of us goes first and the other goes second, and then we pray together the Lord's Prayer at the end. And that's a good way to pray too. We pray together, the two of us. Okay. 
But now communicate with God is different than praying to God, right? Because that implies that you get some information back, right? So we communicate with God through prayer, through words, through thoughts, either alone or together. But how does God communicate with us, or does he communicate with us? Yes, yes. how? Listening to our like problems, and then maybe you might not hear him vo his voice like him directly talking to you. It might just kind of like feel that he's talking to you, and you can kind of feel what he's talking about, or okay. you know, feel yeah, like I, that I he's feel, there listening to you. I feel like I want a Mountain Dew. Is that God saying that to me? No. You think? No, probably not. There's a little voice in your brain. There's a voice in my brain. The voice in my brain is saying, why in the world do these girls have coats on? It's not cold in here. It is. is that God saying that? It's just I want to be warm. No, see, that's the thing. And, there, and there's a lot of people that, that feel that way, that you get these thoughts in your head and that it's God talking to you. Well, it can be, but a lot of times it's not. I, and just think about your thoughts, okay? The thoughts you have in the average day. Do you have thoughts that are clearly not from God. Yes. Yes, you do. Absolutely. We all do. We all do. You know, when a, a driver uh, cuts me off in traffic and I think, well, when he pulls off to get gas, I'm going to pull off too. And as he pulls up to the pump, I'm just going to smash the side of his car. Oh, that's fun. Is that God? No. No, that's me. That's me because I'm, I'm angry and I'm sinful. And now I'm just mad that Katie's jingling her keys so loudly that I can't even talk to you. Did you get my truck key back? No, they're from Kimberly. You have to go get it. I have to go yeah. get it. Wow. Interesting. Okay. It's not far. It's just down at A&W. Uh, but anyway, so that's a challenge. You, get, you have thoughts. You have dreams, maybe. And you think, oh, God's talking to me. You know, I have a brother-in-law that he would say this to me all the time. Yeah, well, God said to me, yeah, da, 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 da. I would say to him, how did God say that to you? Did you hear a voice? Did he write it in the clouds in the sky? He looked up and he saw words in the clouds? No. He said, well, you know, it just came to me. I said, well, a lot of things come to you. It's not necessarily God. And, and a lot of, you know, I once had a, a, a member of this church, a, a woman, mother of three kids. And she came to my office and she said, Pastor, I'm going to leave my husband. And I said, well, okay, let's talk about that because I don't think you should. And she said, well, I met this guy at work and he wants to study to be a pastor. And I'm going to work and, and support him so that he can go to school and be a pastor. And God wants me to do this. I don't think God would because he wants you to stay he, he wants you to stay with your spouse. That's exactly what I said. I said, no, I think God wants you to stay with your husband and your kids. This guy will figure out some way to go to school if he wants to be a pastor, if he needs to be a pastor, if God's called him to be a pastor. But that's not God saying that. But she was convinced it was God saying that. Now, I don't know why she was convinced of that. She actually didn't listen to me. I told her not to leave her husband. But she went to school anyway and left her family, never went back to them, Mother at least not, not at this point. And they're all adults now, so uh, it's not going to happen. But, um, but that's the thing. We, we struggle with this. How does God communicate with us? You know, God said to me, I had this dream. I thought this seemed to be the best way. Well, okay. That really isn't how God communicates with us. He can't very rare okay God communicates with us through his word it's sitting right in front of you that's how God communicates with you so if you want to know something you can look at the Bible and the Bible speaks on a lot of topics honestly it really does and so you can look at that and, and you can see what you what you think what's God saying to you through his word uh, you also 
Do I have these answers on a slide here? No. Uh, there's also something called wise counsel. If you are wondering what God thinks of something, go to somebody who knows God better than you. Like you. Like me. Like your parent. Or a grandparent. Or somebody in church that you know. Or, or just a neighbor who, who really has read the Bible and knows what they're talking about. Go to them. Talk to them. That's why God puts us together in church. He, he doesn't just call us to be Christians. He calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth. That's what we had in the third article of the creed, remember? Did you memorize that meaning? Which one? Yeah, maybe not. Meaning of the third article of the creed. Uh, and so you go to somebody, wise counsel, who knows the word of God better than you, and, and listen to them. Now, one thing with the Bible is, it's pretty hard to know the whole thing. It's a big book, right? There's a lot of stuff in there. And so you need to study it. You need to read it on your own. You need to read it with other people. You need to hear it preached in worship. All of these things lead you to know God better. And the fact is you already kind of know God pretty well. When you're faced with a decision in your life, I can do A or I can do B, how many times do you know which one God wants you to pick? Like... He wants you to pick the better one that's not going to get you a hurt, hurt or it's going to be messy. Or if he stands versus not going to let you do it. Yeah. And do you usually know that? Yeah. Yeah. Usually you do. I, I think 90% of the, you know, 85%, of the, 90 percent of the time, you know which it is. Because you know what God says. We and don't that, always listen to what God says, but we do. That's not the case because don't believe in God. Yeah, well... They're just stuck going their own direction. I wouldn't recommend uh, hanging out with them because they'll take you with them in their own direction. So God communicates with us, not, not through thoughts and dreams and things like that, at least usually not, but through other people and things. Um, here's what Luther said about if you really want to know what God thinks about something. He said you need to make a decision and then live with it for a while. He said, if it's from God, you will have a growing certainty that it's right. If it's not from God, you will have a growing certainty that it's not right. So sometimes you just got to make a decision when you're not entirely sure what God thinks. And you just have to go with it. But be prepared to think, no, this is the wrong way. I'm going to change and make the other decision. Um, it is hard to communicate with God. It is hard. And this goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Remember Adam and Eve were living in the garden and everything was perfect. And God said, you just, you can eat whatever fruit you want except this tree in the middle of the garden here. Don't eat that. But everything else, it's all yours. And God would come and he would walk with them and talk with them in the evening. Talk about easy to communicate with God. He would talk with them. They had conversations. But then when they did eat from the tree that he told them not to eat from in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when they ate that, they didn't walk and talk with God anymore. They hid from him because they were sinners. And God kicked them out of the garden because they were sinners. And now we have kind of a distance between us and God. And it is hard to know sometimes. It's hard to communicate with God. Yes? No, no, no. Okay, never mind, she says. Great. All right, so let's take a look at, whoops, sorry, Matthew 6. Somebody stole my nice Bible, by the way, and I'm a little frustrated with that. Someone stole it? Well, it was right up here, and it's not there anymore. Why? It was here last week when we had class. Oh, because I know that you, you read me borrow a book of yours. Uh-oh. But that was in the beginning. Did you put it in there? No, this is not him. Maybe somebody put it in there. I'm not going to look for it right now. So where are we at here? Matthew 6? Okay, I'm at Matthew 17. That's close. Matthew 3. That's closer yet. Okay, this is talking about prayer now. Jesus talking about prayer. And when you pray... You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at street corners 
that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's the whole thing there. Did that last part sound familiar to you? Yeah, yeah that's the Lord's Prayer. We have it a little different because it's kind of been passed down through the ages in the church. And, and uh, so we, like, we use the word trespasses rather than debts. Debts is probably a better word, actually, but that's what we use. That's our tradition, so we use it. And we add it on to the end. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Which actually is in some of the translations of Scripture. It uh, depends on which Greek text you use. But um, there's some stuff about prayer. You're not praying for other people to see you. You're praying for God to hear you. You're not praying to use a lot of big words and, and a lot of words, but you're you, uh, your father knows what you need before you ask him, so just say what's on your mind. Just say it. You know, in, I don't have this passage off the top of my head for you to look it up, but there's a passage where Jesus is talking about prayer, and he gives an example of a, a really good prayer. And the prayer is, the guy says, God be merciful to, merciful to me, a sinner. That's the whole prayer. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Seven words. That's the whole prayer. Because it's right from his heart. It's really what he wants from God. He wants God's mercy because he's a sinner. And that's and so Jesus then gives us this prayer, which we call the Lord's Prayer, right? We call the Lord's Prayer because he gave it to us. And um, he says, when you pray, pray like this. And so we use the Lord's Prayer regularly. We say it in worship almost every week. There are some Sundays where we don't say it, but there are very few. Um, and we say it at other times. Here at Zion, we say it at the end of all of our meetings. Our elders say it. Our council says it. Um, our committees say it most of the time. Some don't. Um, well, the one I went to that we said. Yeah. I mean, we, we, say, we say the Lord's Prayer a lot because God gave it to us and Jesus told us when you pray, say this. So we do. We say it all the time. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at the Lord's Prayer. Um, the introduction, we call this line the introduction because it's the first line. What is uh, our Father who art in heaven, what does this mean? Now, this is the part of the catechism, and, and you could look this up if you want, but it'll all show up on the screen here. This is the Lord's Prayer from the small catechism, which I didn't make you memorize the meanings. I just had you memorize the prayer. So these meanings won't look familiar to you, but that is what's in the small catechism. That's where I got this from, okay? Our Father who art in heaven, what does this mean? With these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he's our true Father and that we are his true children, so that with all boldness and confidence we may ask him as dear children ask their dear father. Okay. So Jesus tells us that he's our father. So go ahead and ask him. Just like you would ask your father for something. Now I do think that Luther in his meaning there. Kind of missed something. And here's, here's what he missed. You see. Back in Luther's day everybody was afraid of God. You remember the storm when he was caught in the storm and he. If, if I survive, I'll become a monk, all this stuff. Because that's how everybody thought. They thought that God was out to get them, was punishing them, wanted to kill them. And so he's encouraging them to think of God as their father. So you could talk to him. Now, here's what he missed. Because we live in a society where people don't have that kind of a fear of God. Right? We, I think the problem much more in our society is people 
think nothing of God. It's no big deal. I'm not afraid of him. They kind of maybe think of him as a, a brother or a rich uncle or something. Their dad. Their dad, yeah. Their heavenly dad. And so, because Luther focuses on his meaning on this part of it, our father. But Jesus also said, who art in heaven. So we want to think of him as our father, somebody we can go to and ask. But when you go to him and ask for things, remember that he's in heaven, seated on his judgment throne. And he can give you what you ask for, or he can strike you dead with a bolt of lightning, whichever he chooses. You have no say in the matter. Okay? So, it's, it's in part exactly what Luther says in his meaning. You know, you tenderly ask your father for something and he responds positively because he's your father, but also he's the judge of the world. So when you go to him in prayer, in the Lord's Prayer, recognize that he is still God and you're not. That was my pocket making that noise, by the way. Can I see who it is? Who is it? It's nothing. All right. Whoa, I almost missed my pocket. How dare you. Okay, so any questions on that, the introduction? Okay. Then we have these petitions. A petition is when you ask for something. And so the, the Lord's Prayer asks for things. There are seven petitions, things that we ask God for. Okay? So the first petition, hallowed be thy name. What does this mean? You know what hallowed means? The word hallowed it means holy or, or like set apart as something special. Okay? Like if, uh, if you go to a, a Taylor Swift concert. No, you like Taylor no. Swift? No? Who do we like? Um, Garth Travis Brooks? Scott. Who? Travis Scott. Travis Scott. Don't know him. Um, you know Travis Scott? No. no me neither. Garth Brooks. Garth Brooks? Okay. Think of whoever's whoever you want to go to their concert because they're yes. just this fantastic person. And when you go to their concert, they reach out and you get to shake your hand. They're right Hi. here, right here, and you shake their hand. Hi, baby. And then you decide at that point, I'm never washing this uh. hand because it, it touched Travis Scott. I'd rather be my left than my right. Okay, then reach out with your left, okay. Now, probably that's not going to happen because eventually you're going to wash that hand. Uh, but, you know, sometimes like if, like maybe a famous guitar player threw you uh, his pick, okay? No. You're going to take that pick and you're going to put it on a shelf in your room. You're never going to play guitar with it because that might wreck it. It might break. But you're just going to save that pick forever. You know, it's like a, a baseball. You ever see The Sandlot, the movie The Sandlot? No, it's too old for you. But anyway... It's about these kids that play ball out in this empty lot. And, uh, and they, they hit their ball into the a yard with this great big dog that'll kill them all. So they... I, I, I watched that one. It's, yeah. little, it's like little kids, right? It's little kids, yep. Yeah. And so they go, and this guy goes, well, my dad's got a, a ball on, on a shelf in his room. So he goes and gets the, <coughs> the baseball, and they play with it. Well, it turns out, long story short, that ball was signed by Babe Ruth perhaps the greatest baseball player of all time. It had his signature on it. And they played with it, and guess where the ball ended up? In the yard with the big dog. And this is like a Babe Ruth ball. And they finally realized, uh-oh, this is a problem. Anyway, they end up getting it back. It's a long thing. But anyway, uh, because that's that kind of a ball, it's been signed by Babe Ruth, you're not going to play baseball with that. You're going to put it on a shelf and look at it, right? If a guy hits a hole in one in golf, you take that ball and you put it on the shelf and you never golf with that ball again because that's a special ball. That was your hole in one. Okay, and that's what hallowed means. It's set aside for something special. It's holy. It's precious, okay? And this says that's what God's name is to us. It's holy and precious and set apart for something special. Don't use it for other stuff. Okay, that's what the commandment would say. Okay, what does this mean? 
God's name is certainly holy in itself, but we pray in this petition that it may be kept holy among us also. Certainly God's name is holy, but what we're asking that, that we would keep it holy. We would. I would. Okay? How is God's name kept holy? God's name is kept holy when the word of God is taught in its truth and purity, and we as the children of God also lead holy lives according to it. Help us to do this, dear Father in heaven. But anyone who teaches or lives contrary to God's word profanes the name of God among us. Protect us from this heavenly Father. So you, you follow it. You live your life according to the word of God, and that keeps his name holy. You, you don't, and that profanes it, turns God's name into profanity. That's what profanes mean. Uh, okay, so... You know, and, and here's here's the way I look at it. Okay, I'm a pastor. You're not. But, you know, maybe some people know you're a Christian. Maybe some people know that you you go to Zion Lutheran Church. Okay, so if you're you're acting up in school and you're uh, picking on somebody, calling them names, locking them in a locker. Huh. You ever lock anybody in a locker? No, because my locker is broken. Okay. Nobody, I never locked anybody in a locker either. One time a kid tried to lock me in a locker, and I punched him in the face. Yeah. Sorry I did, but he didn't lock me in the locker. Anyway. Were you taller than most people? or? Well, at, at times. Um, I mean, I was this tall when I was in ninth grade. And, and in ninth grade at this tall, I was taller than most people. And I was, I was pretty strong. I played a lot of sports, and I was pretty strong, and nobody messed with me. Uh, then, as when we got to high school, everybody else kept growing, and I didn't. I, I was about the same age. So, but anyway, I didn't get picked on a whole lot. Um, there were a couple of kids that tried some things, and I just stopped it, and that was the end of it. But anyway, um, but if if people see you doing something like that, something bad, cheating on a test, calling people names, telling uh, spreading rumors about people. Stealing somebody's lunch money. They might think that's how people from Zion Lutheran Church are. They steal people's money. They spread rumors about people. They tell lies. Well, you don't want that to happen, right? I used to tell my kids when you go to a game at the school or some kind of activity at the school, don't wear a shirt that has your name on the back because I don't want them to know that you're Kleppies in case you do something bad. Mm -hmm. But if people know that you're a Christian, you represent God. So you keep his name holy by acting in ways that are pure and holy. By speaking in ways that are pure and holy. And when you don't do that, then you are not keeping God's name holy. So what we're praying here is that God's name would be kept holy everywhere by everybody. But especially we're praying here that God would help us to keep his name holy. When I pray that in the prayer, I'm praying that God would help me to behave according to his word so that his name is seen as holy when people look at my life. Okay? Okay.